Lucas, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've Lucas. I don't know if you've noticed this, but like, I'm uncomfortably ripped now. Like, I, I mean, I mean, I guess you can't see it since we're we we're, we we don't record this over video, but like, I'm I'm flexing really really hard, and it's all thanks to that that Ring Fit adventure. Oh, you've been playing Ring Fit Adventure 2020, uh, getting Diesel, getting Swole, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. New Year's resolution to get Ring Fit, and I'm glad you're succeeding, um, putting me to shame with this new buff bod you got yeah. going on. Yeah, man, I've just been, uh, I'm sweating loads, I gotta, I gotta take on Drago, I gotta keep doing my squats, keep doing my, uh, my knee, my knee presses, all this kind of, all this kind of stuff, it's been, like, on the real though, it's been really, really good, it's, uh, been a fantastic way to exercise. A good way. What one of the better Januarys physically that I've had. It's mostly just moping around and eating the left Christmas leftovers. Uh, well, I uh, have not begun my New Year's resolution of reading three books. I have yet to read uh, a book, let alone three, uh, or uh, more accurately, a page of a book. Um, but you know, I got 365 days to work on that, so it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, you know what? Speaking of people's New Year's resolutions, perhaps our special guest today might have something that <laughs> she is working on. And I, <laughs> I definitely, sh I definitely should have asked this before we started recording. Uh, Christine, is it yes. less? Is it less Cody? Lascody. Lascody. Christine yeah. Lascody. Everybody is joining us. And uh, Christine, uh, have you lived up to any New Year's resolutions that you've done so far? I, I also have a New Year's resolution to read more books, and I am about halfway through my first one. So oh, she's got you. She's got you beat, Lucas. You oh hear that? Oh my goodness! Slowly I, getting I, there. It's how shameful of me. Oh my word! You see, that's the kind of that's the kind of resolution where you like three books. I've got all year to do that, and then by the time we hit <laughs> December, you're going to be like, "Well, I need to read three books immediately, and I don't know which ones to read." <laughs> oh, oh no! I got the book. I got the books picked out. I got the books ready to go, loaded, locked and loaded. Uh, it's just the will, will. I just I don't have the will to to do so. <laughs> just got to make time for yourself, man. Oh, see, true. That's true. This is what this is what's going to motivate me as a guest on the show, um, an, an outside influence. <laughs> so, Christine, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Uh, but for those who may not be familiar, uh, do you mind giving us a quick introduction uh, and uh, tell us about kind of what your relationship is like with Arthur and, of course, who you are as a person? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to you guys for having me. Uh, I, I discovered your podcast and freaked out because I love Arthur so much. And I was so excited to find out that you were out here doing this show. And I basically begged you on Twitter to let me be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all it, that's all it really takes is that we, we look for that enthusiasm. Uh, so I, I've been watching Arthur since I was a freshman in high school. And to put that in perspective for you guys, uh, I'm 36 years old. So I have been watching Arthur for um, well over 20 years. And uh, I started watching it when the show was in its third season. And I would come home from school every single day, and I worked at my local library. <laughs> so wow. I would uh, I would go to work at the library. I would like work in the children's section and just like sit there reading Arthur books, and then go home and watch Arthur, and just kind of fall asleep watching it sometimes too, because it was just such a relaxing, comfortable show, and uh, it's always just made me feel really good. I I love the show. I've kept up with it, uh, you know, over all twenty plus seasons. Uh, I watch it with or without a child. I have a five-year-old daughter, but she's not really into Arthur yet. No. I'm trying. I'm working on it. <laughs> Ooh, what has she got on the go? She the Paw Patrol, Peppa Pig. What, what no, are we working she's with here? A, she's a hardcore Pokemon and Super Mario kid. Ooh, like, starting oh. them young. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She plays full on, like, the cards. She does the math. She's got this, like, really sweet Pikachu calculator. She does the whole nine yards. <laughs> I don't um, want a Pikachu calculator. Yeah, it's it's pretty sick. It's great. Um, so, so yeah, I I just I watch the show even without her. It's just you know I liken it to the fact that some people love The Simpsons and some people love Family Guy and you know some people are like Bob's Burgers people. I'm just an Arthur person, and I think that's 
that's one of like the most defining traits about me actually <laughs> people give me gifts uh that are, that are like stuffed animals of arthur oh um, lucky I have, I have a uh, i have another podcast that i actually host two podcasts uh one is called the shipping room where we talk about like tv relationships and whenever we would do a mailbag episode our listeners knew how much i loved arthur so we would get like questions about tv couples and then that one random would slip in that would be like hey christine so like who do you ship on arthur <laughs> So. <laughs> I, I, I mean, not to not to steal too much from your other show, but is there is there any big standout? We've gotten a similar yeah. question. Yeah, and, now, and we I, gotta know. now we got to know. Yeah, we got to know. Oh, we got to have this big, discussion. Big Arthur ships. Uh, I mean, so this one's going to be kind of kind of controversial. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure where y'all stand on it. But mm-hmm. like, part of me kind of hardcore ships DW and Binky. Interesting. Uh, okay. Like. I think I think when they get older, they've got that bond over the green potato chip. They they like have like a I don't know. There's just there's a little chemistry there. I know they're children and they're fictional, but you know, you never know what the, they're going to grow up and be like. The, the, there could be a later in life kind of yeah. romance happening. Exactly. Listen, if Taylor Lautner's character in Twilight or whatever can fall in love <laughs> with her baby, uh, I suppose why not Binky be destined to be with DW. Oh, yeah, you know, man. you know what? Anything's possible after we've kind of hit that watermark of culture. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, Christine, I have to ask: wh- uh, when you were watching as a freshman in high school, yeah, um, was that when Arthur first premiered? It was. Yeah, Arthur premiered in, uh, I believe, 1997, and yes. I was a freshman in high school. In uh, I started watching it in 1999. I see. I it's I and I I I must I must apologize because I know that I know that some people, including myself, are very sensitive about age. But it's just like, <laughs> wow! Now I see it from Lucas's perspective of just like I'm the babe. I am baby now. <laughs> so Speak I ha- for yourself, I ha- Will. Okay. Yeah, yeah really. Then what are you? <laughs> that, that's just that's that's just wild to me that uh, and and on a, in a good way that you it, that it spoke to you as someone in high school like I was um, the target demographic essentially when Arthur first started but the, the fact that it was able to uh, do something for you when you were that age is kind of speaks to its appeal. I I mean I think the show is really well written. It's always been very smart. And I think that they write as much for the adults watching the show as they do the kids. And, you know, you guys have mentioned some of the jokes that are a little more steered towards the older audience watching the show. And and I think that's just part of the magic of why the show keeps going and why it's one of the longest running cartoons in history. You know, I mean, it, it's it's a really well written cartoon. And I and I don't know that anyone is ever going to give it the accolades that it properly deserves for it. But, you know. It's it's hanging in there a long a long time. What are they on season 23, 24, something like that? Yeah, 20 something. Speaking of accolades, I wanted to make sure to mention this in the episode. This came across my uh I have the um Arthur PBS Google News alert and this came across I think this was last week. Uh the Glad Media Awards came out and Mr. Ratburn and the special someone, the episode where Mr. Ratburn gets married, is nominated for the Glad Media Award for Outstanding Kids and Family Programming. Nice, nice. Big tings, big tings for Mr. Ratburn and the yes. special someone. Uh you love to see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that was weird. <laughs> and, and it's yeah, and it's in there with like heavy hitters like Steven Universe. I know is uh, is one of the nominated shows in there. So that's mm-hmm. like that's its whole bag. So the fact that it's in such esteemed company is really really speaks to how well generally that episode has been received. I loved that episode personally. I was so excited. When uh, when the for articles first came out that it was happening, everybody was sending them to me because I made a comment on an episode of The Shipping Room one time that, well, of course, Mr. Rappern is gay. And I just said it offhandedly, <laughs> like, like just, a, well, of course, isn't this common knowledge? Like, and this obviously wasn't common knowledge when I said it. And uh, and all the listeners, you know, responded to that. And so as soon as that article hit, I was getting it sent to me from so many angles, <laughs> like, look, 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 look. And I couldn't have been more excited. I thought it was a wonderful move. Yeah, I'm really glad that we were able to kind of um, put it, it even if it, I, I'd like to think that even just a nomination is proof that it kind of did what um, it, it, it spoke to the people that it uh, was looking to speak to. And I'm really glad that they decided to take that risk. Unfortunately, it still has to be a risk in this day and age. But uh, 
Yeah. No, it's. I'm really I mean, excited I mean, for that. I mean, we yeah. liked that moment so much, we commemorated it with the Will and Lucas t-shirt on the Elwood City Limits store. It's one of the many uh, uh, little sort of uh, uh, vignettes that are present on that shirt. Absolutely. Uh, it's a fantastic design. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, please do. And speaking of people checking things out, man, I've got all the segues today. Um, I've, of course, we have to, we have to start our, uh, before we get into the episode that we're going to be talking about here in Arthur Season 9, we want to thank the people who are making this possible, that being our patrons. Our patrons who are helping to decide um, a big turn for the show that's, that I'm, we're going to be announcing soon. By the way, patrons... Number one, if you're not in the ECL Discord, please let me know. And number two, if you haven't voted in the Patreon poll going on right now, patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits, please make sure that you do have your voice be heard because we've already, the poll's going one way, so it could go, like, if uh, more people vote in it, then it could go in a completely different way and could change the announcement that's coming next week. Either way, just want to make sure that your voice is being heard. Voices like Aaron DeFilippo and Alex, Caitlin Harrington, Chander LaFave Boten, Christine Wong and Sierra S, Dan Mike Dawson Silva, Emily K, Froppy, Ian Collis, Jake Bailey, Joe Sue, John Dulong, John Griswold, Kat, Kaylin Krogal, Kevin Noon, and Kristen, Leanne S, Light Relentless, Macy Ball, Marlo Stanfield, Michaela Gibson, Pretty Cool Stairs, Rachel Pearson. Riley Stevens, Shayna Bennett, Stella, Teresa, and William. I also didn't want to uh, seem to be ungrateful. I'm I'm jealous, Christ, uh, Christine, that you um you got gifts of stuffed animals for your <laughs> podcast. I think that's awesome. We how, we did get a great gift uh, that I want to mention uh, here as well, and that was from I believe that was both from Stella and Teresa, if I'm not being mistaken. The uh, Lucas the DW pins that they gave us. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, say, yeah. A year or two I ago. remember the. I was thinking about that actually when she was talking about getting gifts. I love those DW pins. It's it's on my laptop bag, and I always take that with me if I'm going to be editing the podcast uh, at work. So, Christine, uh, we're jumping here into our episode today. We're going to start off with Francine's Big Top Trouble. Um, I don't know if you've gotten this far and you're listening to the show, but we are past the point where I was watching Arthur uh as a kid like this is when i was like yeah you know what that's i think that's kid stuff now so <laughs> i kind of left it behind this is all new to me so i mean awesome. I, I i watched the episode and everything but this is this is completely new to me um you said that you started watching in high school did you ever really like stop or have you been watching consistently all all the way through no i've kind of just been watching consistently all the way through when a new season starts wow. i get real excited <laughs> You're more on top of the game than we are. This is, so, so you watched this when it originally aired. I did. Yes, yes, nice. I did. <laughs> so, it, so we start off here. Um, Arthur and DW playing checkers, and Arthur's kind of bigging up his role here uh, as a big brother, talking about like you know where would DW uh, be without his sage advice. I'm gonna contradict something I said in the last episode about Arthur's season nine voice. Um, I think we had started to get used to it in season nine, episode one. Yes. In this episode, immediately it's like, oh geez, Arthur really does sound young. Arthur sounds like DW. <laughs> mm, mm. I think Will said that last time too. Yeah, like, and that's what I was thinking was Arthur he, sounds like he's the same age as DW. He's Especially very, who, he's very squeaky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just and later on when he talks to like Buster. Buster, it's the same voice he's always had, uh, and so it, that puts it into like stark contrast. By the way, uh, Christine, I, I want to take this opportunity to ask, who's your favorite Arthur character? Oh, it's Buster. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Yes, yes. I love the Buster. Buster, Buster another, was definitely my favorite us. as a kid, and I think Lucas, Lucas, would you say he's your favorite character, or is that Binky? Uh, so before we started this show, it was Buster, but I'm a, I am a Binky stand through and through now. Yeah, <laughs> I think we I think we both are. Um, Binky rules. So, yes, <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> they even made an episode about how much he rules. Um, so yeah, Arthur is just saying, you know, I give DW the sage advice, and the, he, like he's curled up on a log in the yoga pose, and just like it's like if a mosquito lands on your arm, just blow gently. Eh, Which is not good advice, by the way. That's 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 not good. Like, just hit the mosquito. Like, I know we're trying to be um, a, a pacifist and stuff like that, but I remember when I was a little kid, 
Uh, I would not let a, like hit the mosquitoes because I felt bad. I didn't want to kill a living thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I would have significant bug bites when I was a child, and I would go camping, oh. and I would let them do that. <laughs> so just lightly blowing, not not good advice. Just swat the mosquito away. Just opening your arms and being like, take my blood. <laughs> teaching DW how to roller skate, which doesn't go too well. And then saying that once she gets to Lakewood Elementary, uh, everybody will know her as Arthur's sister. In fact, like a pack of the old reliable extras see her and say like, is that Arthur's sister? (laughs) Welcome, Arthur's sister, which I thought was funny. I like how Arthur assumes that DW's entire identity just revolves around him. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny, like assuming that DW's. I yeah, you're right. That her identity would be anything but like, <laughs> you know, she as soon as she walks in Lakewood Elementary, she's going to be known as herself. As I as I'm pretty sure will be will be key for the rest of her life. It sounds it sounds awful. Like you're walking someplace and they're like, "Oh, you're that person's sister." Like that's not a good feeling. No. Did, did your younger sister ever get that, Lucas? Yes, like- absolutely. Uh, I was actually thinking. So me and and my little sister are, I think, the exact same age difference than Arthur and D.W. And so we never went to the same school at the same time because I'm four years older, right? So in its three year increments. Um, so uh, uh, I heard about like teachers at my high old high school would be like, "Oh, you're Mancini's sister." Uh, uh, that used to happen all the time. They'd be like, "You're so much quieter." <laughs> I I was always uh, I was going after in after my big sister, so they'd be like, "Oh, you're Andrea's brother." Oh, we expect <laughs> good things from you, and you know, a little, a little bit of pressure there. Uh, what about you, Christine? Do you have any siblings? I'm an only child. No one ever knew I was a wild card. <laughs> oh, nice. You just you just you're in and you're out and you're yourself the whole time. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, so the whole episode is actually about Francine, and ki- and it touches on her relationship with Catherine a little bit. By the way, speaking of voices, we get to hear a bit more of Catherine in this episode after we've done the voice actor switch. I do kind of miss her older voice, which we've talked about before, Lucas. Her kind of um, she, uh, her older sounding, like disaffected '90s teen voice, but she does kind of sound more like a real teenager now. I think. It's true. It, there's something. It's funny. The the difference between Arthur. I. It's just that I find the voice is too young, but the delivery and the acting is fine. Mm. I think I highlighted this before. Something about the Catherine delivery. Like, it just doesn't. I don't. I don't want to be too mean because I'm not a voice actor. But something about the delivery. I just don't believe it or something. Like it's just. I, okay. There's something missing from the performance. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we start off with the Frenskis, and uh, uh, Francine is going to be going to circus camp. And uh, this is the same circus camp that uh, Catherine herself did before. So, again, Francine kind of following in her sister's footsteps. We only get the bare minimum here from Oliver Frensky. Like he, and, and, and also, worth noting, like basically nothing from Francine's mom. But, like, man, <laughs> especially from if you've listened to our season one episodes, I miss Oliver so much. I miss wacky Oliver. Yeah, Francine's dad was always, like, a big personality. And then they just reined him in until he was, like, barely a C character. It's very... Yeah. It's interesting. I wonder why that was. I don't know. I just feel like I would love to party with Oliver Frensky. Oh, my like, <laughs> Toss the, a garbage the can gar- around. Yeah, take the garbage truck out for a spin. Yeah, man. Oh, I was at work today, and um, we were talking about, like, um, implements that we would need, and uh, the... Uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Basically, the secretary at my work was like, uh, and it's like, oh, yeah, why don't you get like a pointy stick? And I'm like, ah, yeah. And she's like, yeah, I got that from Arthur. And I'm like, ah, yes, the pointy stick. <laughs> you were uh, like, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to think I think she I think she knows. I think okay. she knows. OK, uh, at least I, at least I hope so. Otherwise, that was just a good call. Uh, so they go to basically this circus tent that's set up somewhere outside it's called Budnikov's circus and uh Budnikov I believe is is the Russian goat that uh, greets them uh, walking on his hands Boris uh, Boris Budnikov is his name <laughs> uh, uh, so what, or- do we, what 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 what's the group here what's kind of our initial uh sort of it's, thoughts on Boris. Boris to me, he's got the wireframe glasses, the sideburns and the literal goatee. Uh <laughs> I don't know why, but he looks like me to be like the kind of guy who like is way into like DMT. Like he looks like like the kind of guy who's like way into like lucid dreaming or something. That's just like the vibe I get from Boris. Just very in touch with his like his brain in that way. 
Yeah, like, he's, like, into, like, yeah, Boris is, like, one of those guys who's, like, into crystals, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get yes, that. Yes, those. Hey, okay. Yeah, I get that, that, like, new agey vibe a little bit. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. like you're sure that he goes to the coffee shop and he asks for, like, all of the vegan ingredients. Not that there's anything wrong with that, because there's not. I'm not trying to no. say that. Listen, I work no, in a coffee I, shop. I, I, oh. Oat milk is delicious. Oat milk is delicious. Soy milk is delicious. Almond milk, you you name it. It's great. But he definitely strikes me as the type that like asks about all of the ingredients and where they were farmed and and what altitude the beans were grown in. Or 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 if he's a goat is he like, "Excuse me, is is this uh is this a uh, discarded can vegan?" And he just like <laughs> just eats it anyway. <laughs> What was the name of that children's book? The one of like the goat that ate everything and then got sick because he ate everything. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What Nobody's ever about. able to remember this. I remember reading this and loving this book as a kid, but it's yeah, it's just about a goat that goat eats everything and gets eating sick. Eating children's. Book. See, and you said that, and I thought of the um, what was goat it? Mad TV. Children. The Mad. No, uh, Jim Brewer. Didn't he have like a goat character on Saturday Night Live? Maybe. I'm I'm like way before your time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lucas, you I, you might know a bit more about that. I'm not I'm not much for SNL. Is it is it Gregory the Terrible Eater? Gregory the Terrible Eater. That's it. Okay. Excellent. Gre- I'm not familiar. I never read Gregory the Terrible Eater. I I I think the message of the book was like just don't eat garbage. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't know. It's just like hey, don't eat everything you see or else you'll get sick. Just like okay, thanks. Like great. <laughs> Thanks for thinking so little of me that I'm like, <laughs> like a vacuum cleaner to you. Um, so yeah, the kids are practicing all of all of these routines, uh, and right away, uh, sorry, what, what's the goat's name again? Boris. 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 Yes. So, it's, there's everything's got a very European circus vibe. I, I was mm-hmm. trying to figure out what Boris's accent is. It's definitely like Eastern European. Like I can't tell if he's supposed to be like Russian or like Ukrainian or like. I couldn't give you the region, but it sounded Slavic to some yeah, degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he he rem- he recognizes Francine's last name, Frensky, from Catherine, and he's like, "Oh, we expect good things of you." <laughs> and uh, so Francine tries to do a cartwheel, isn't able to do it, but everybody else does it perfectly. In fact, Binky's able to pull it off without a- ever having done it before. Yeah, Binky, no warm up, uh, does like a triple cartwheel. Uh, he says, I've never done one of those before. Uh, so I guess it's all the ballet. He's, his balance is solid. He's, uh, yeah, he's, nice, he's nice and limber. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, like that was kind of something I mean, something the skinny kids did. You know, as a fat kid, I was never confident enough to try a cartwheel. Never could never do one. I remember the... The most I could do was a somersault, and I had to practice for days on my mother's bed with, like, pillows all around me to even try doing a somersault. No, I don't think I've done a cartwheel to this day. I used to be – that used to be an old party trick of mine was to pretend to do a cart – like, attempt to do a cartwheel and then fall and then make everybody laugh. Um, <laughs> much like, actually uh, – th- this is a technique that uh, Fred C. utilizes later in the episode. But uh, uh, yeah. I myself, I, I, I – as, as a skinny kid, I too cannot do a cartwheel well, so don't feel left out. I also, I also cannot do a cartwheel. All right, so the no cartwheel club over here. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, the Francine just can't get the hang of doing a cartwheel, which is a little bit demoralizing to her. They try to do like the backflip on the uh, on kind of the bungee thing, the apparatus. And, and, and so this is where I started asking myself, you know. This is a pretty involved circus camp. Like, this doesn't seem like day one kind of stuff that they're starting to get them to do. Uh, uh, later on, I mean, things only escalate from here. But I was wondering, like, yeah, no what kind of waiver did Francine sign? Like, uh, is there any sort of kind of regulations in terms of these eight-year-olds uh, doing just like a real deal trapeze? <laughs> All of it seems very sketchy. Yeah, at this point, it seems okay. Like, our, our local N- Neptune Theater, I think, did, does, like, summer circus camps. And this seems kind of in line with that. But, yeah, as we get into it later, it's it's a little bit more harrowing. Um, so Francine's really down the dump. She wasn't able to get any of the circus stuff. And she remembers Kath- uh, Catherine, like, brings out her old circus stuff that she wore. Because apparently, like, this young preteen, maybe teenager, they let her just do a tightrope walk. And, and yes, like, there's a net. Yes, she has a harness. But it's like, 
I don't it's know. Like the like, flying Graysons over here. This is crazy. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Catherine is going to be the star, like the actual like flying trapeze star of the Catherine movie. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the Catherine movie. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> but Francine very resistant. Like Catherine's trying to offer her like her old uh, performing clothes, and you know Francine again kind of projecting as is her way, just like no, I don't want to wear that that stupid stuff. Um, but yeah, the whole thing is that she's trying to do all these phys- physical feats, including like you said, Lucas, the trapeze, which. Wow, this seems advanced. Yeah, I, I just wanna I wanna see like what legal documents did they like I know I you have to sign a waiver to go to like the trampoline place here in town. So I, I, I sure hope these kids, if anyone gets hurt, they lawyer up. Because I don't know there's something about Boris, I just don't trust him. But then like I also, the yeah. I was gonna say, like, the less frightening stuff too though is really fun to watch them doing too, because like Arthur is literally just tossing two pins back and forth in the air. It's just two bowling pins. Like, that's it. And Francine (laughs) looks at him and she's like, man, I'm never going to be as good as Arthur. And she proceeds to throw three bowling pins up in the air. And it's like, well, the reason that he's doing it is because he's literally just holding two bowling pins. (laughs) And you're going straight for the full juggle. Like, come on, girl. It takes a little more than that. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's a deceptively difficult skill juggling. There was a brief phase in the '90s where there was like um, where juggling was kind of in for kids, and I can never really get it. It's beyond my hand-eye coordination. Um, I also never got the thing as kids of so. There's a point where like uh, they're waiting to go on the trapeze, and uh, I think it's like Binky says that Francine kind of looks like Catherine. And she's like, "No, I don't," <laughs> and. Arthur says that she kind of even sounds like her a little bit. And I used to get that when I feel like this, when I was younger of just like, don't compare me to my sibling. We don't look anything alike. I don't know. It's just I never I never got I never got the whole thing of just like re, really just being like, no, no, I don't. It just wasn't my relationship with my yeah. sister. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of can't relate. Me and my sister look very, 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 very different. Um but I will say this whole moment kind of plays a little strange. Like, I don't know. Um, do, you, do you find that Catherine and your Francine sound alike? Not at all. No. Yeah, they, they don't Francine really. Sounds I mean, they like do, a grown they woman. do look alike. Yes. <laughs> Especially yeah. So, she sings, she sounds like a grown ass woman. <laughs> so, so to hear like Bakey and Arthur be like helplessly like, oh, you kind of sound like Francine, like in a good way, or you kind of sound like Catherine, like in a good way. I'm like, uh, not really. Like, why are you guys yeah. saying this? Yeah, especially now. Like this just seems like a weird time to bring it up. Uh so Francine, this is this is starting to really get to her, like bother her that Catherine was able to do all these things and she wasn't. So that night she has a dream that Francine is essentially the sequel to Catherine that isn't as good. So like you said, Christine, it's Catherine the movie where she's like in she's sort of like a James Bond esque spy that's doing all of these circus things to baffle this cadre of ninjas. It's like it plays like a trailer because it's just like you uh it's like you loved Ka- you loved Catherine and Catherine the movie and my favorite line from this was um you know now introducing Catherine to Francine. Uh she's kind of back and almost as great as the first one. <laughs> I just really love the honesty in this in this trailer guy. <laughs> and yeah, we get we get the sequence where it's like Francine is like kind of juggling, and then the ninjas show up, and then she runs away. Um, so I would I think you know Catherine to Francine sounds like a great deconstruction of the first film. You know, kind of uh, uh, subverting your expectations. I think it'll be a critical darling. <laughs> Yeah, it, it it won't it won't make it won't make money or be celebrated at the time, but in like fifteen years it'll be critically reappraised. Exactly. <laughs> and then poor like Francine in her in her dream she hears Arthur and Binky like or Arthur and Buster <laughs> criticizing the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like ah, sequels are never as good. Just like, <laughs> talk about a person here, dog. Damn. Um. So so much to the fact that she wants to break away from out of Catherine's shadow that she decides to quote unquote disguise herself the next day as um I remember her her name is Yixner. Does she just name herself yeah. Ixnerf? It's Ixnerf. it's Ixnerf. And I thought to myself, how fast did she come up with that? Because that's really clever. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Like I I I never thought to just 
just uh, put her name the uh, put her last name the other way. It actually really works. I also love that she's doing like the phony French accent. She's just like, "I am uh, how do you say?" like that kind of thing. <laughs> and especially funny given that Arthur is generally made in Quebec. So well, just thinking and, and, of the Canadian voice actor having to do this obviously phony French accent. What's what's interesting about this is that like usually when characters like d- d- kind of pull this and they're like, okay, I'm going to like disguise myself um, or I want to be different. I'm going to separate myself from like my sister. They would basically, you know, they'd put on like the glasses and the mustache or something really traditional in terms of a costume. Or the elephant I, trunk. If it's yeah, Arthur. elephant trunk or what have you. This is completely inscrutable. Like I don't even know what this character is. It's like a French person, <laughs> but she's wearing like lederhosen and like a mauve like shirt and like a beret with stars on it that looks like Toad's head, um, yeah. and it's just like, what is th- this? Truly, is unlike. Uh, not only is it unlike Catherine, it is pretty much unlike any person that exists. Like I don't know even know what this is supposed to be. Honestly, does... I thought yeah, that sorry, she was. Christine, go on. I thought that she was going for the clown thing, like right off the bat. That like when the whole you know as the storyline progresses, I was like, oh. I thought that that's what Ixnerf was all about to begin with. <laughs> no, she just happened to do it at exactly the right time when they were just about to focus on clowning, which she didn't know about. So, I mean, hey, magical realism, you know, that sort of thing. Speaking uh, about magic know. and realism, uh, yes. we're now introduced to, we're, first we're introduced to Ixnerf, and then we're introduced to the throwaway character of the week, Fishface the Clown. Let me tell you something about Fishface the Clown. He truly is the clown for 2020, the clown for our era. Okay? <laughs> um, you know, I, I know ki- the, the kids of these days, they're big into sending the clown emoji. You know, you double text a girl. You, the, the, you've, you've been clowning. You're, 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 you deserve to get a clown emoji, what have you. Uh, yeah. Fishface is that type of clown. His delivery of, like, his, like, spiel about, like, clowning is a serious art. It is, like, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think at some point, like, Francine is, like, attempting to do a cartwheel or what have you and, like, falls into Ixnerf. Everybody's laughing. Um, and Ixnerf just says, everything hurts, but that's normable. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's oh, no, the no, last not Ixnerf, fish face. Fish face says that. And I'm <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. damn, that- fish face mood. <laughs> That's the that's the that's the last note I have for this episode. Yeah, Fishface kind of n- now that you put him in that context, he reminds me of somebody who like tweets in all lowercase. So it's like I could be joking, but also I'm kind of not <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> oh my god, he's the clown we just don't deserve. Yeah, I, I think I think Lucas hit the nail on the head. He yeah. really is the clown for modern times. Now that we're <laughs> seconds away from midnight, according to the atomic clock. Oh no. Anyway, not to, not not to bring everybody down. So uh, Francine gives gives a go at clowning, and it turns out she's actually a little bit better at it than she thought. This actually remind this reminds me of the episode where Arthur and his friends were all dressing up as clowns, and Arthur couldn't be funny, thought he wasn't funny, and then he like played the piano in a funny way. Yes, I had to like uh, jog my memory. I was like, wait. Yes, <laughs> I think it's I think it's literally called Arthur the unfunny. It's it's just like yeah. he eventually finds out that he can be funny if he kind of goofs around on his piano. So Francine literally like runs into Fishface, and which is where we get the everything hurts, but that's normal thing. Yeah, Fra- and, Francine's like comedy is a little bit less like Arthur's sort of humorous like musical comedy, and is a little bit more like straight up just jackass. Yeah, just down, 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 down. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody could totally edit that where it's just like just edit the jackass theme song into all of the all the bumps francine takes yeah i'm francine and this is fish face <laughs> and that's what she ends up doing at the big performance uh everybody else kind of either does the juggling or the trapeze and all this kind of stuff and then eventually francine comes out as the clown along with fish face she and she does all of the stuff everybody else was doing but just kind of screws it up in a humorous manner like does the cartwheel falls on like a pie and then gets like spritz with water and then yeah, it's just she develops a whole routine with Fishface, who's uh, re- rejuvenated by how well Francine did at clowning. And uh, the, pretty much the end of the episode comes along when Catherine, uh, th- this was actually kind of sweet for a little bit. Catherine's very proud of her. And uh, we we rarely see Francine and Catherine when they're not like at odds about something. So it's nice to see like uh, Catherine taking a little bit of big sister pride in her and being like, yeah, you did great. I was never very good at clowning. I'm actually not surprised that Francine is good at clowning because Francine is a very charismatic character. Like we've seen her like charm audiences and do the singing thing. And, you know, mm. she she's she's just a really she's a good 
a, she's a good presence on stage. So it, it's not surprising to me at all that this would be her like niche. And it's almost, I think the more surprising part is that it took her so long through the episode to figure out that that was the thing she was going to be good at. I guess there just needed to be the sad clown to really yeah. make her feel seen. <laughs> That's right. She needed it. She needed to be inspired by fish face. And, 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 and to this day, fish face is a uh, inspiration to us all. <laughs> Well on, that, well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break here as we get ready to uh, talk a little bit more about our pal George in the second half of our episode. Uh, we'll be right back. Support for Elwood City Limits is really easy. First of all, you can visit us and follow us on social media. You can go to facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. On Twitter, you can follow us at ECL Podcast. We're also on Tumblr, elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com. You can also go to our Instagram, Elwood City Limits. Follow us over there, too. You can also contribute to us on a monthly basis over at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. We have corresponding rewards for when we hit certain levels of patronage. So please, if you feel like you would like to donate financially to us, you're under no obligation to. But if you want to, patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Also, if you want to have a little bit of ECL on your person, go to teespring.com slash store slash Elwood hyphen city hyphen limits hyphen store. Make a little rhyme out of it. <laughs> you can go over there and get a t-shirt, a hoodie, or a tank top with the Elwood City Limits logo on it. And we've got even more designs coming in real soon. So make sure to check back there. Finally, share this podcast with a friend who likes animation, who likes Arthur, or who just likes having fun. Sharing us on social media, sharing us with people you know, and sending in your emails to elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. All are fantastic ways to support us, and we thank you very much very much now let's get back to the show and we're back we're going to be talking going from francine's big top trouble this is a very top heavy episode and i get to use that joke again just like i did two weeks ago uh with george blows his top uh so this one i i was definitely a lot more i was like they're not going to do two circus episodes in one day are they George blows his top, a.k.a. George is pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is great. I mean, I think I think we're very partial to George heavy episodes these days. And uh, this this definitely took it in a way that I that I thought was very entertaining. Um, so the cold open again, not focusing on the main character. It's focusing on Arthur, who is asking uh, Mom Reed if he can go to see Wacky Zack the Zombie King. To which mom just immediately just no, not just only no, it, it's a no. PG it's a PG thirteen movie, and this is why Arthur's been denied. Um, Will, have you ever been turned away from a PG or I guess here in Canada a fourteen A film? Yeah, I think that um, I re- I recall my parents and my sister like watching. Um, I think it like the Sixth Sense. I remember them watching the Sixth Sense in the living room, being like, "Okay, William, you need to go in the kitchen because we're going to be watching this scary movie." So and... when I was a little when I was a little kid, I was actually I was above fourteen, but I didn't have any ID on me, and I was trying to go see. Uh, this is actually going to age me quite a bit. I was trying to go see uh, Cloverfield, which was yes. like, uh, and and I I was above fourteen at the time. I must have been like fifteen or sixteen or something. But like the guy wasn't going to let us go in because I think I had bought a youth ticket because I wanted to get in for cheaper. Uh, yeah, and he was like, "I'm not going to let you see this movie." And so I was like, <laughs> "Well, dang, we got to." But they'll exchange the tickets so we can watch something else. So me and my friend went to go see The Bucket List in theaters. Uh, <laughs> oh, like just wow. me and. Me and and my other 14 year old Hobie is going to watch this movie about like Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman, like <laughs> oh. in their final days. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that because we were literally the only two people in the theater. So amazing. we could like, like yell and heckle at the bucket list. That's wow. amazing. What a, That's almost better than going to go see um, Clo- <laughs> Cloverfield in theaters. Uh, the only thing I remember from the bucket list is the part from the trailer where Morgan, they're going like sky, uh, skydiving and Morgan Freeman goes, I hate your rotten guts. That so, is, that I don't is, know. The, the, that's the reason you remember that is because that's the best part of the movie. <laughs> that movie Oof. is not, there's for a 14 year old, it's a, it's a fine, typical, like, you know, sentimental Ron Howard movie. Uh, not the most exciting thing when you're 14. 
Not the most exciting uh, thing when you're 25 either. I had no desire to go see that movie. <laughs> oh my god, um, Christine, ha- have you ever uh, has that ever happened to you? Like the the whole trying to get into a, a movie that uh, was uh, above your above your station because you're you're in a you're in America, right? Yeah, and even in America, we uh, if it's I tried to get into a rated R movie once before I was 17. And the usher actually stood at the door and like wouldn't let us in, and it was so it was so weird. Oh and then my like, God, who cares? We who cares to... that much, man? Like it's minimum wage. It, yeah, it was bizarre. And then we went to like we went back to a like, I think the movie was like Jawbreaker or something, which was also an R-rated movie. And we mm. left it and went back into the other theater and the guard or whatever i guess he was looking out for us and he stood there at the door and he was like no nah, man i'm gonna kick you guys out if you try to come in here again and i was like seriously this is so it was it was uh the only time in my life i've ever been denied access to a theater <laughs> gotcha wow that's that nothing like that has ever happened to me but then again i'm i was i was a good little baby and i never really went tried to get into any movies i wasn't allowed to go see um, yeah, and so the entire cold open here is talking about how kids are so often told no. It's practically the only thing they hear. So uh, there's a great one where Binky asks, you know, since it's Arbor Day, can we have class outside, <laughs> Mr. Rappern? This I love. I love this. Not only is Mr. Rappern saying no, but he just like the the run up to it. He's like, no, <laughs> like this, As the he deep slowly breath. Closes, closes the window. Shade. Not only not. Only, yeah, not only do you can't you not go outside, you can't even see outside. Uh, we oh, sorry, Christine. I was gonna say, and also uh, the the part with Buster's mom, how Bitsy's just got eyes in like every direction of her head because she catches everything Buster is trying to grab and saying no to it. Well, you gotta be with with just a little a little food monster like Buster. You gotta you gotta be you gotta just b- keep your head on a swivel. You never know when he's gonna just like go ham, like literally go ham and like. Just to eat everything in sight, or like I live in fear, or like take the ham and put it in a box, and he'll like maybe pull it out six months later and do a science experiment with it. Yeah, I guess if it, actually, I guess if it was Buster, he'd be going ham on. Oh gosh! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, also, we, also we get here, our, it, yeah, yeah, we yeah. have our our animal hierarchy moment of the week where um, <laughs> you know Muffy is lamenting that her dad won't give her a hippopotamus, and this here, so. Uh, Jen and I, my wife, have uh, we've been rewatching Friday Night Lights, and it never occurred to me before how much Mr. Crosswire is like uh, Buddy Garrity from Friday Night Lights. If either of you watch that show, oh yeah, <laughs> and it's, it, I think it, it's the hair, oh, it's yeah. the suit, and it's also the like, uh-huh. it's like the Buddy Garrity Lila uh, relationship of you can just imagine <laughs> being like, n- just like Lila, I can't get you a hippopotamus. <laughs> Oh my god! I'm never gonna watch Friday Night Lights the same way again. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's better: is it Ed Crosswire with the Buddy Garrity voice, or is it Buddy Garrity voiced by the guy who does Ed Crosswire? It's, oh, it's... let's try it. Let's try it the other way. Let's. I want to hear. I want to hear Ed as as Buddy. So, so he'd be like, like Coach Taylor. I really disagree <laughs> with the way that you. I really I like think you should better. be thinking about yeah, the that sponsor. One, that one's better. <laughs> okay, oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> oh, fun fact for you watching Friday Night Lights. Uh, the yeah. the actor who plays Jason Street, Scott Porter, he is uh, he is one of the cast members on Heart of Dixie, my my other podcast. Oh, cool! I'm so glad. I'm so glad that he. I mean, I, I this is going to sound backhanded, but I'm glad that he got work after Friday Night Lights. Like, there's a lot of people in there that I'm like, I never really heard from them again, or they kind of just ended up doing more TV stuff that I never watched. So good for him. That's 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 awesome. So the actual ep- well, and the cold open ends with Arthur uh, accidentally stepping into DW's uh, mud pail and saying, "That was a time I really wish that I had heard no." I liked DW's. Now I have to go make more mud. <laughs> <laughs> The actual episode starts off with something I never did. The kids are at school doing a swing jumping uh, competition. I've never jumped from a swing before. No, it's always I, too scary. Yeah, I was too scary. I, I'm pretty swing averse in general. Like, so I, I, I've never been a big swinger. You know, people they they say that they're gonna go over the 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 top rail or whatever, and and I would always freak out when I got high. I was never a big swing guy. 
I've never been a big swinger. Lucas Mancini, <laughs> no, exactly. 20. exactly. I've never been a big fan of the Vince Vaughn vehicle swingers. Uh, you know, <laughs> telling people, "Oh, baby, you're so money." Uh, not my, not my style. <laughs> never, didn't you don't like that Drake song? Just swinging. I, not I your do, favorite. No, no. <laughs> Wait, do you guys call him Drake? Like, do you call him Drake in Canada, or do you call him Aubrey Graham? This is just this is we, a legitimate we, question. We, we, no, we call him we call him Drake mostly. No, yeah, I feel like uh, the only time I'm ever referring to him as Aubrey is if we're if if it's you know yeah. time to clown on Drake, then it's like okay, Aubrey. Okay, exactly. That's so funny. Like I I love that you thought that there was regional differences. <laughs> well, I know like just he's, like, he's like from with the Canada. movie rating system, it's like oh, over here over here we call him Aubrey. <laughs> He's always going to be Aubrey to us, eh? I go down the streets and I says, hey, Aubrey, what's going on there, Aubrey? Listen, I'm a Degrassi kid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. So that is what I know him from first and foremost. (laughs) I know, like, especially I I also grew up watching Degrassi around that time. I would have been like just freshly a teenager watching Degrassi and then just like hearing about what the what the, J- Jimmy the kid in the wheelchair is trying to do a rap career like okay buddy good luck with that well, that was me I was like I was like wait what <laughs> I I'm just picturing you two being like who's gonna listen to that ridiculous it was really weird dude it it felt like it felt like you know oh, this TV star is going to try and be a rapper. Okay, like, see you on the see you on the cruise I'm going to attend in 10 years, pal. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I, I When somebody first said to me, like, oh, have you heard the new Drake? And I was like, what? And then they showed me his picture, and I was like, that's Jimmy from Degrassi. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he can walk again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so never jumped from a swing before. Uh, but this is a George centric episode and the it's kind of starts here when they the kids get a uh, a pop quiz a pop math quiz I believe it is and Buster asks to borrow a pencil from George and George loans it to him and then realizes he doesn't have anything to write with so he has to write his answers in crayon and uh, it kind of ends up uh, screwing him over because then he has to take the test uh, after school because Mr. Rapper can't read his crayon answers. Uh, this just reminded me of all the times somebody asked me to borrow a pencil in school and never gave it back. Whatever happened to the pencils that we loaned and never got back? Where oh, are they, they? they? They went to me, Will. That, that was me. Oh, that was you. That was, that was, I was a habitual pencil stealer. I was a straight-up buster in this episode. So this is when I, my note here says George caught simpin'. Um, and I, I, I don't think I had fully grasped when I wrote that the extent of George's simping behavior, but because you know, with with the title like, uh, uh, what is it? George blows his top. Is that it? Yes, yes George blows his correct. top. I was expecting like kind of like you know Michael Douglas falling down, starring George. Uh, but what we get instead is just like yeah. moment D-horns. after another of just George straight simping. And th- this first one, like who hasn't loaned a pencil when they really should have just kept the pencil? That's fine. But these things stack and accumulate to the point where it's like, okay, George, buddy, you got to have some self-respect. And also, this is probably the most in the wrong we've ever seen Buster. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's one of my biggest notes here. So you, you, so you're, you focused on George Simpin. I was more. I, I guess I took it the exact other way of like, is this the most dislikable Buster has ever been? Yes, that well, was so, me okay, too. I, I, we don't want to put the cart before the horse here because I think yeah, yeah, this, yeah. this pencil situation is still well within Buster's character. There sure. is a moment where Buster takes a turn in this episode where I'm like, oh my goodness, I've never found Buster so insufferable before. (laughs) It's actually right after this when uh, George grabs the last slice of Boston cream pie and Buster's behind him in the lunch line. He's like, oh, that's the last Boston cream pie. I missed it last time too. And he's literally like whining. And he makes this like little face and I wrote, okay, so my first first note was George caught sipping. This note was, Buster is wily. <laughs> okay, see, so I didn't think that this was so out of character for Buster, only because when it comes to food, he's kind of a wild card. So him asking for the piece of Boston cream pie, I was kind of like, all right, this is kind of within the boundaries of Buster Baxter. Yeah, it's not, it's not out of character, but it's also like, 
Man, this is like it's kind of embarrassing to watch, especially as like it's it's as, worse. It's worse than him just being like, "Hey, can I have the pie?" Is him trying to like go George into being like, "Oh, he's like, oh, pie is my favorite. If only there was a way for me to have the pie." Because he doesn't just straight up ask George, "Hey, can I please have no, your pie?" No. And it, and in fact, and in fact, George offers it to him. He's like, "Oh no, George, I couldn't possibly. Are you sure?" Like he's uh, doing that whole thing and. Like, like, listen, I'm coming at this, I'm, I'm relating to this a little bit, because when I was Buster's age, I actually prided myself on being, like, a food mooch from my friends. I'm not proud of that part of my, of my life, but that's what I used to do. <laughs> Buddy, I'm a just food kinda... mooch to this day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I was looking at this, and I'm like, oh, man, this is what I looked like when I was that age. Oh, God, it's just the secondhand embarrassment. And, jo- and George, the kind-hearted simp that he is <laughs> gives it away in favor of pears with syrup uh, lucas do you mind I, I'm just glad defining... you asked i'm glad you asked <laughs> d- I, d- ha- d- I i i i i want to go on the record here and say it's sure it's probably not as good as Boston cream pie but i do want to conclusively say that pear pears and syrup does not sound that bad no it doesn't i'm, I'm sorry lucas i i'm just gonna need you to quickly define a simp for me simp actually Okay, let me let me. Well, okay, so there's there's two types of people. This is all according to TikTok. Okay, this is all going off the, the TikTok. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, you're you're either, and this is a very 2020 mood as well. Is you're either a king or a simp, right? So there's king yeah. behavior and there's simp behavior. You could um, be a king or a serf. I don't know why they didn't go with that. But with, fair with enough, a serf, I don't know. Yeah. I maybe I I think it can't, it's it's not a status. It's a state of mind, right? So even if you're a serf mm. and you know you spend you live to be 23 and then die of the bubonic plague and spent your whole life making like one stained class window. And that's, that's still King behavior. You know what I mean? Like that, that, you're still, you got that King mentality, but, okay. um, okay. It, it, you can, you could be a King, you know, I'm the, I'm the King of the kingdoms, but I can't have a kid. I'm going to make a whole new religion and divorce my wife. That's simp behavior. You know what I'm saying? So even though you're a King, you can still be a simp and so on and so forth. <laughs> Okay, I think I got it. I just, I just needed, I just needed your context on that before we kept going. Uh, so George gives him his uh, cake, and then the next thing is that George loans Buster his like Letterman jacket. No, so, he no, doesn't so, loan it to him. <laughs> yeah, oh, Buster, no, he doesn't. This, right. this is where it's really crazy. Is yes. Buster steals it? He straight um, up and, goes into George's locker and just takes it and replaces it with his like weird put pullover hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> Buster's like it, it, it. He's like, I thought we could switch today. Now I will say this: um, if you freeze frame right here on on George and Buster standing in front, of, 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 I w- sure. It doesn't really fit George. It's a little oversized, but oversized in right now. George and Buster in this shot are dressing, okay? Um, Like, the Letterman does happen to fit Buster perfectly. It matches his shoes. But I will say, like, George has, like, a little bit of that, like... He's got that like like 1998 like Harmony Corinne like kids look where he's got the oversized Dickies khakis you know what I'm saying and he's got the green he's got the green Chuck Taylors and the big nylon weird zip up hoodie thing like that's kind of a vibe too. Like, well, yeah, and and like it, I I kind of see what you're saying. I'm not as in I'm I'm not as up on fashion as you are, but this seems to me like I was I, I'm looking at it now and just like you know what I could see George in the next double XL cipher. Yeah, exactly. Song. George looks like he's a member of Brock Hampton. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's true. Going off to do a video. That being said, as good as he looks, he doesn't like the jacket as much as his own jacket, and he's well within his rights to think that because uh, Buster did straight up swipe it. And he finds an old hairy lollipop in the in the kangaroo pouch, too. Um, yeah, so... Uh, George kind of being pushed to his limit here as Arthur is uh, walking home with George. And by the way, relate to this as well. Oh, it's my God. Arthur- I, I, I'm glad you said this, Will. This is probably the most I've ever related to Arthur. Like, Arthur sounds like <laughs> me in this segment where he's like, yeah, Wacky Zacky's, like, so cool. Like, it's funny for this, this, and this. And it's like, I haven't seen it, but Vicky told me that. I've had so many embarrassing conversations in my life where I'm like, 
Oh, yeah, like, Breathless is obviously, like, Godard's best film. Like, I haven't seen it, but <laughs> it's, it's widely credited with the creation of French New Wave. Like, this is Arthur right now. This moment with Arthur is, like, all of my worst qualities. Like, <laughs> Liter- Literally, when I was in, like, grade six, a friend described to me the entire plot of the movie Pet Cemetery, and then I, like, repeated it word for word to another friend. Like I've literally done this before. Oh wow! <laughs> I, I felt I felt very seen as I often do with Arthur, but George is incredibly angry. Speaking of incredible, uh, George has a bit of a dream sequence here where he becomes the Incredible Hulk. This is something that I remember former guest on the show Viv told me about was going to happen eventually, and I just didn't expect it to happen here. It's just George Hulk's out. Well, something I didn't expect to happen is that they kind of added something new to the whole character that he could breathe fire. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of mixing the streams here, but you know, uh, it's I, maybe that's just to, so they don't get sued. Probably. He's he's big. He's green. He's 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 ripped to hell and can breathe fire. So technically, not the Hulk. He even has like the he, he's wearing like the pink pants, and they go go down to the shorts. Uh, Will, is is this kind of what you're looking like right now with all your, your ring fit adventure in that you've been doing? You know, it's not that far off. Okay. I gotta, I got, I gotta keep it 100 with you. Are you oh, breathing? Well, so amazing. How many steps away from breathing fire? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, That's the next level. I think I have to beat Drago first. Like, yeah. conclusively, I think they give it to me when I finish the game. Okay. You gotta up a little bit more creatine powder, and soon you'll be breathing fire. And then, and then once I'm done Ring Fit and I come on the podcast, like the mic is literally going to be hot fire. I know, I, <laughs> I know, I, I know, I keep it that way normally, but yes. like, it's over for you after after that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an interesting 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might be out one mic. <laughs> uh, so Arthur kind of talks with George a little bit about this at the Sugar Bowl, and he's just like, "Yeah, Buster's kind of like." T- taking advantage of me and it makes me really mad which is uh, kind of interesting it's a situation that we haven't really tackled yet but definitely happens um in well at, at, at practically at any stage of life uh, but especially here when you know kids have not de- fully developed empathy so like seeing uh the consequence of their actions is a little bit hard sometimes depending on their uh perspective Luckily, Arthur swoops in with a very, very, like, helpful reality check and that he's like, George, man, like, stand up for yourself. It's like, what if he wants, what if he wants your shoes next time? It's true. And he yeah, talk, talked about Buster like he knows this about him. But then again, Arthur and Buster, I think, borrow a lot of things from each other. So maybe Arthur's just kind of gotten used to it. We've also seen, though, our, you know, Buster uh, Arthur, as much as he complains about being a baby and stuff like that, our, Arthur is no pushover. We have seen Arthur impart physical violence upon people that have drawn his ire. Mm-hmm. So maybe Buster <laughs> just knows he knows he can pull this stuff with George, but he doesn't want to get up like, you know, he doesn't want to get slumped over and, and try and ask too much of Arthur. You know what I mean? We, we, we've seen Arthur knock some people down in his time. It's true. Uh, so George decides to practice what he's going to say to Buster first off on Wally, uh, his, uh, his dummy. And, uh, they have a little bit of a back and forth here. Wally has to put socks over his ears in order to fully <laughs> pretend that he's Buster. Um, and it's, it's funny. George can't even get the upper hand on Wally as Buster. <laughs> like he, he's having a hard time. Like, and Wally goes in like real histrionics here. He's just like, how could you do this to me? I treated you like my own flesh and blood. <laughs> I have that as a note that George is doing Wally doing Buster so well. He's convincing himself. <laughs> He has he has a really good talent for that sort of thing. Like, I mean, we know he's talented with ventriloquism, but he's like a character inside of a character inside of a character. He George might actually be like a good actor when he's older. It's Wallyception, Wallception. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something. There. there you go. Uh, and and it's, and I mean, the shot of Wally with the socks, like basically over his eyes, is pretty funny. Uh, so 
it doesn't really work for George. He tries it over like an old school tape recorder with like a mic insert and everything. Lucas, they were probably using this in RTA back in like 2003. Oh yeah, I know. This was making my make, reminding me all of my like weirdo friends who make like noise albums and like <laughs> sells like the cassettes on like discogs and stuff. Like, oh dude, come check out my like soundscapes like tape I made. I made six of them. What uh, you know, I'll you know, check out my band camp where I have my weird like harsh noise like contact mic music i was like maybe this is you know this is how george is gonna cope is he's just gonna get way into like uh uh he's yeah spoken word records and stuff (laughs) and just like rare tape recordings i could definitely see that that george is gonna become like a field recording guy yeah (laughs) um so buster shows up while he's trying to do the the recording thing and um, he's and he like takes notice of the tape recorder. He's like, "Hey, this is cool. I'd like to borrow this sometime." And then G- George just kind of passive aggressively is like, "Fine, take it." And he's like, "Oh, right now? Uh, okay." <laughs> uh, he invites George over to Muffy's because they have Virtual Goose version twenty nine point two. So I know that this is way ahead of of when the Untitled Goose Game came out, but is yes. is this? This feels almost like a direct reference to it, even though I know it's like so many years before it. But that oh, was I what I put that together. But that was what oh, I pictured yeah. immediately. Was oh god, did they predict the Untitled Goose Game? <laughs> My I goodness, wish. they must have, because there was Confuse the Goose and then Virtual Goose, and and I, you've really like uh, uh, discovered something here. Just blame blame it on a goose. Uh, <laughs> That's that's awesome. I'm so glad you picked up on that. Some reason, even though I played a bunch of Untitled Goose Game, never never hooked it up with Virtual Goose. That's awesome. Also, we got the the Baxter Day reprise. Oh yes, he do, he sings a little bit of Baxter Day into the recorder, which was very exciting for me because I love Baxter Day. <laughs> oh, Who Baxter does? Day <laughs> Baxter Day is excellent. Speaking of which, uh, Lucas, isn't Lucas Mancini Day coming up soon? Or? Oh, we are. We let let me tell you something. Aquarius season is well underway. So uh, uh, Lucas Mancini Day is uh, yeah. It's only it's going to be a couple of weeks here. Um, but, but, uh, the festivities have already begun with the, the beginning of Aquarius season. So I'm, I'm, I am at my most powerful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, there's also a bit of a throwaway line here where, um, or sorry, th- that's kind of coming up. So Buster takes the tape recorder. Uh, George is a little icy to him, but still wasn't able to, uh, kind of do anything. And then he has a, horrible daydream where he thinks that like what if buster asks him to get wally and we just see here buster offering to clean uh mr molina's uh gutters with wally and it's again like meaner than buster would ever be so it's a little jarring but it's also like buster cleans the gutters with wally then he like throws him out and then George imagines him going to the ice cream store and Arthur being like, hey, where's Wally? And he's like, I don't know. Could be anywhere. <laughs> Can we talk about for like just a second, the image of Wally, like the upside down image of him in the garbage can with all the flies around him. That was like actually chilling to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, I was I was freaked out by we then see Mr. Frensky throw the garbage with Wally in it into like the trash compactor or whatever into the back of the garbage truck. And I'm like. Damn, Buster should have killed Wally. <laughs> yeah, and, he's, and 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 you can even hear him going like, "No, <laughs> it's horrible." It's like, okay, so first I, this week I have to watch the death of Mister Peanut, and now I have to watch Wally die. <laughs> like, who will they take from me next? Oh, you know what I mean? I I'm still really raw about Mister Peanut. I'm I'm devastated. Yes. Sorry, F's in the chat for Mister Peanut. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, so George is just like, no way, I'm, I'm never, I'm never gonna let him get Wally, and uh, he sees Buster coming up to the, um, or, or oh, sorry, there's a there's a throwaway line before Buster comes by, and he's like, I already, it was already hard enough getting you back from DW, and I really want to know the story of how George got Wally back. Yeah, there's there's kind of like it's it's we need like it's like the Star Wars expanded universe. We need someone to fill in the blanks here of the, the we've talked about this before about how the Wally timeline's a little bit confusing and also kind of Wally's role in George's life is a little bit confusing because mm-hmm. it felt like th- there was th- George had kind of sworn off Wally and learned how to be his own person um and then given Wally to DW and then there's this kind of like blank like 
there's this gap where we don't know what happened to Wally, and then now George has Wally, but he's like this like soothsayer, like this this confidant that provides George with with advice, um, but then kind of just stays in the closet beyond that. And it's like, so what's going on with Wally? Like, how did George get him back? And is is George still not quite over his whole Wally thing, or is Wally just it's it's I feel like we're still missing a piece of the Wally puzzle. There's got to be a fan For fiction sure. somewhere. There, yes, I would almost put money on that. In fact, I'm probably going to go look for that after we're done. <laughs> Safe search on, of course. Uh, so Buster, so Buster shows up at George's place. We get a confirmation on George's last name, Nordgren. Mm-hmm. Nordgren. Nordgren. In in the Christmas special, he um, his family do. Uh, where's his family from? Like Norway, I think. I think it was Nor. It was Norway or. Switzerland. Yeah, something like something like that. Nordgren so, is a Scandinavian, Scandinavian watch company. A, a watch company? Yeah, there's a there's a watch brand called Nordgren. Okay. Copenhagen, so Okay, so De- Denmark? Denmark? Danish maybe? Denmark. Okay. So somewhere around that kind of area. So thanks I'd always appreciate getting Characters' last names. Uh, George tries to uh, discourage Buster from coming in because he thinks he's going to uh, he thinks he's going to steal Wally. But actually, Buster is returning all of the stuff to George because he ended up hearing uh, George practicing uh, talking to Buster on the tape recorder. So eventually, like 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 I said before, kids at that age, eh, empathy is a little hit or miss. But Buster's gen- generally a good kid, so he's he a good kinda, good buddy. He, yeah, he took he took the hint, and in fact, uh, we even get to hear a little bit of a snippet of what Buster did with the tape recorder, recording a, a song called "Funky Rabbit." Yeah, no, Funky Rabbit. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of like, if you get that Funky Rabbit, t- bro. Uh, did you see they someone selling the funky rabbit tape on Discogs? They only made one of those. It's crazy. <laughs> and uh, that's basically where the episode ends up. Is that they you know come to an understanding? They're still friends. All that kind of that kind of stuff ends up very positively. And uh, George puts Wally back in the closet. There. I just had one more note of the fact that it's really funny how um, borrowing things kind of takes on a bit of a different context because i remember when i was a kid like i borrowed things all the time and i like let people borrow things and now that i'm older i'm very a lot more stingy with letting people borrow things as i find a lot of my friends are as well um it it, in in some cases and then in others i'm kind of okay with it like have your borrowing habits changed at all no i never let anybody borrow anything even as a kid interesting like I, fi- I find that that's kind of more acceptable when you're an adult is that you can just say like no I'd rather you didn't borrow that I think whereas when you're a kid there's like like we see with George here there's a little bit of like okay I guess I think because I was an only child I was so protective of everything that I had <laughs> that I never wanted to share anything so it was like no, oh. no no it's mine it's mine it's mine like you guys were talking before about like did you let people borrow your pens no I never let anybody borrow anything from me somebody wanted a pencil I was like nope sorry I need all four of my pencils <laughs> I was a pencil hoarder <laughs> all right and because because of course as we see here you might never get those pencils back and that's why I would get the A and Buster would not. <laughs> there you go. What about you, Lucas? Borrowing habits? I, I'd be out here borrowing. I got a copy of the Maltese Falcon on DVD from my friend Josh that I've had for like six months and still haven't watched. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think a buddy of mine's got my copy of Mario Odyssey right now. We It's just one big, you know, take a penny, leave a penny over at the at the Mancini residence. I think I also I think I also have a copy of Breathless by John Luc Godard that does not belong to me. Just a bunch of like weird Criterion movies <laughs> that I've borrowed from my friends. Um, I'm getting yeah, anxiety no. just listening to you talk about the things that you've borrowed and haven't <laughs> given back. <laughs> uh, well, not not to heighten that, but I remember I borrowed the StarCraft Player's Guide from a friend of mine when I was like 14. And I had it until I moved out of my parents' place at, like, 25. Oh, God. By which point, I was not friends with him anymore. <laughs> well, that's... Yeah. That's, so, so, that's you, so, you, so you missed out on situations like that where you just never get your stuff back. So, frankly, I'm not surprised, nor am I... Uh, nor will I, you know, condemn that sort of non-borrowing <laughs> behavior. I see a logic to it. 
Like, no, now I'm I'm really starting to like uh, uh take a, a a good look at like I really do have a lot of my friend's stuff. Like I have a Meg Mog and Owl, like three of those graphic novels that belong to my friend Mike. I'm really starting to to realize that I, I I've accumulated quite the horde of things that do not belong to me. But no one's been asking for the back. So ah. are you looking around and realizing that eighty percent of your possessions are not actually yours? <laughs> Uh, I may, I I may just be yes. <laughs> All right. So before 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 Christine breaks out in hives, let's take it to the uh, to the end of the episode here. Uh, so Christine, yeah. love to hear you weigh in first on Francine's uh, big top trouble. So I I like this episode. I like episodes that kind of deal with sibling stuff, and I like the juxtaposition of. Francine and Catherine alongside, you know, Arthur and DW because it really kind of drives home the fact that DW is basically like Francine. Like the way Francine is now is potentially what DW is going to be like in five or six years. And uh, I always like comparing those two sibling relationships. Um, that that episode also had the line, uh, you can't win at circus, Francine. <laughs> <laughs> which, which just made me laugh a lot. And I think I'm going to add that to my random like Arthur quotes that I shout at people sometimes. Um, I, I like that one a lot. I thought it was, it was a, uh, it was a good one. N- not my favorite, but not my least favorite by any means. Uh, Lucas. I was a little bit bored by Francine's big trop trouble, big top trouble. Excuse me, big trop trouble. Big trop trouble. Yeah, big top trouble. Um, no, no, uh, Francine's big top trouble. Trouble. I, I found it a little bit boring. Uh, I think it's because it's it's kind of too similar to episodes we've seen before, both in kind mm-hmm. of the the the. Um, like you were talking about earlier about kind of the, the episode where Arthur realizes the way to be funny is to mess up on purpose. Um, we get kind of the exact same solution in, in this episode. Some of the stuff of like Francine being nervous about going on the trampeze. I was getting flashbacks to season one and DW on the balance beam. Mm. Um, it, oh, it, that's yeah. a good pull. Wow. It, it, it just all kind of seemed kind of tried and true. And even this like mentality of like Francine living in her sister's sa- sha- uh, a shadow we saw this like almost they reference it in the episode about the the horseback riding and stuff like that so i kind of felt that this was just too well-worn territory to keep me engaged that being said it did give us fish face the clown very true um i think you may i think you make a good point i kind of agree with you look I'm, I'm more on the side that it's okay like you know here on the show we don't like to to dog on the episode too much i thought it was fine but i it's yeah it's funny talking about it that um it's you do see the bones of other uh, episodes in this one's uh, structure, so we've kind of passed the territory. But at least we're just we're going through it with different characters. So uh, I did appreciate the more nuanced look at uh, Catherine and Francine than we normally get because normally they're at each other's throats, and we're just kind of used to that. Now it's just like okay, Catherine gets to be proud of Francine or like want her to do her best. And so I appreciated that. It's a bit of a different look at it, and especially through the circus, that's kind of a fun place to go. And um, I did, and I did like Fish Face the Clown as well. So there's there's stuff in here to like. It's not my favorite, but it was it was fine. I've definitely uh, definitely seen seen worse. Um, as for George blows his top, I actually I I liked this. I I you know wouldn't say I loved it, but I think I always appreciate the ones that I relate to, and I was definitely. At points, a very like uh, very meek child, and you know, in some ways, I'm a very meek adult as well. So you know, the whole thing of being a bit awkward um, uh, about bringing up, you know, an awkward situation of just like, hey, you're borrowing too much of my stuff, and I don't really appreciate that. It can be a little difficult, especially for a character that is as quiet and reserved as George. And we also get to see a bit of a different side to him as well, that he does have a breaking point. And we get to see him, like, angry, which we don't normally see him, or, you know, frustrated and that kind of thing. I also did think, like, I was kind of shocked watching it, but I did appreciate us getting to kind of see one of the more, like, extreme sides of Buster, where he's, like... The, the kind of behavior that we're used to seeing in him does have, like, a bit of a dark side. So, and I mean, it, I say dark side. It's just him kind of being a little bit pathetic, a little bit of a mooch. And that's that's as far as it goes. But I did kind of like 
filling that out a little bit. So like you said, Christine, it is in his character, but it's such an extreme of his character that it's a little jarring to see at first. But I, I, li- I liked that. I like that. Uh, Lucas. I kind of loved this episode. I I really Uh liked it for a lot of reasons. Like you said, I think it's actually a really unique lesson. This is one of the more nuanced morals of an Arthur episode to have is teaching kids what it's right to say no and to stand up for yourself. It's kind of something that you don't see tackled in kids' shows too often and being like, you know what, you shouldn't... It, it, being nice is one thing, but you shouldn't let people walk all over you. Um, mm-hmm. and, and usually, kids' shows are so kind of worried about imparting anything negative about children that it's always very positive. Like, okay, share your toys. Uh, you know, you should be nice to everyone. Treat people how you want to be treated. But this was actually a very nuanced take of like, but don't let people like use you as a doormat. Like, have some self-respect um well yeah and, and, well, yeah, I, and go, sorry i just i just wanted to agree with you and add that like um oh no i lost it i'm sorry keep going i'll, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get it back I'll it's just back. That, that well this is something that you know i probably could have like you said i i probably could have heard that when i was a kid you know i i was my mentality was always to be like oh i want to be nice like i'll sure i'll say but people will take advantage of that when you're you're young and naive um so i actually i i thought that this was a really interesting like kind of moral but then that aside this is a really funny episode as well there's some like really really good lines and moments in this episode both from kind of like the side characters to buster just acting like so crazy it just it just <laughs> you give him an inch and he's taking a mile in this episode um and and just some really good moments from george like uh like you pointed out christine him acting like three layers deep he's like leonardo dicaprio in that one scene in once upon a time in hollywood where he's an actor playing an actor playing an actor um uh, I really, really enjoyed this episode front to back. If there's one thing that I, I would actually take you issue with, it's that I kind of wish there was a moment where George kind of kept his nerve and stuck up for himself. The way it kind of resolves mm-hmm. is that Buster realizes he's in the wrong, so mm-hmm. George never really has to take that action. Yeah. Um, though I guess he kind of does in a way in that he it was his recording that Buster hears. But I would have kind of liked a moment where, and this would be really hard to do, uh, where kind of bu- the George asserts himself, but not in a mean way and kind of sticks up for himself finally and Buster's like oh I didn't understand that's how you felt um, but bes- that aside I-, I really enjoyed this episode yeah and really quickly what I was going to say is that at that age it can be really easy for kids to accidentally take advantage of each other because we, we don't we don't have the social awareness to know each other's like social cues or like what's appropriate and what isn't so it, it also makes sense as like Buster as an 8 year old just kind of ends up taking advantage of this person that he is his friend but he just kind of doesn't have the understand the life experience to know that this isn't uh you know a, a good thing that you're doing so that's what i wanted to say uh christine i i actually really agree with everything lucas said um you know like as a as a parent one of the things for me that you know we teach our daughter is mm. you know it's okay to to share and obviously we want you to share but it's also okay to say you know no i i don't want you to play with that thing that i have right now and i think mm-hmm. this episode did a really good job of you know that nuance like Arthur when he has that conversation with George in at the the sugar bowl when he he's like well why didn't you just say no that you didn't want him to play with that and I thought that that was a really insightful thing for two you know boys to be sitting you know across from each other just having this really like adult moment to be like just tell him how you feel because I don't feel like that's the kind of honesty that gets or, or like I don't even think honesty is the right word. That's not the kind of conversation that gets promoted very often on TV between, you know, two young people. It's it's always like, you know, the Tibbles who are, you know, throwing punches at each other or, you know, DW just shouting and stomping her foot. Uh, whereas, you know, I thought Arthur in that moment was just kind of like, well, I mean, it's OK. Just tell him no. Just stick up for yourself. It's OK. And um, that's a lot of what we try to do with our daughters just to be like, hey, it's OK to say no sometimes. Just don't be mean about it explain how you feel and and that's okay you're entitled to feel that way um that being said uh, i also really liked the the funny stuff in here i liked the exaggerated buster uh attitudes um i i I agree it was really funny there were there were lines that killed me i love the uh the uh reprise of baxter day um it's it it hit a lot of notes for me that were really positive so I, i really liked this episode a lot so 
Good, and I'm really glad that you were able to bring a little bit of uh, of parenting expertise to this. That's that's a now that's a that's a view we've definitely not had on the show. <laughs> I'm glad to be of parenting service, I guess. <laughs> At least, at least for this point in time, neither Lucas and I have have kids of our own, so we can't exactly uh, attest to that to seeing it from those from those eyes. So I think we appreciate the fresh look, and we really appreciate you being here, Christine. Uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, recording with you, and we're really appreciative that uh, w- you you uh, you literally reached out to us on Twitter and we're just like, hey. And once I saw the podcast in your profile, I was like, okay, this isn't just some like crank. <laughs> this this isn't some egg being like, I want on pod. Podcast. Oh no! Okay. You, you see, you seem legit, and you have definitely backed it up. <laughs> I didn't want to get like too analytical on you guys about Arthur, because like I can get really analytical. So I was trying to like well, hold back my an- my my deep analysis. <laughs> Okay, well the next the next time you're on with us, you got you got to bring it because we've been doing this for nine seasons. Like we're getting analytical up in this. Piece. Okay, you got yeah, it. Did, did you did you notice that in in the scenario where George was uh, picturing what if what if uh, Buster like took everything that he owns and it was getting moved? The movers were ducks. Uh, and the last time, <laughs> all the duck movers, the duck movers had previously made an appearance. I think they were setting up Muffy's birthday party or something. Yeah, yeah they were setting last... up the the rolls of grass. Yep. Yeah. Why are the movers always ducks? Beautiful weather, huh? <laughs> There's some interesting stuff to the animal hierarchy on this show, for sure. <laughs> oh, br- oh, sister, you don't know the hat. Well, I, actually, I think you do. I think you, you probably know more about it than we do. So, Christine, uh, I'd love for you to tell uh, the audience where people can find you, uh, your podcast, your social media presence, anything you'd like to promote right um, here. So you can find me on Twitter at Chrissy Marie 47 No one in my life calls me Chrissy, so I don't know why I've chosen that to be my Twitter handle, but I, you know, I've gone with it. It's been this long. I can't change it now. Um, you can uh, listen to my podcast about Heart of Dixie. It was a, uh, a CW show here in the US, uh, and I believe that you had it in Canada as well. We talked about this before we started recording. Um, it is called Long Live the Heart, and you can find that on uh, Apple Podcasts and Libsyn and Spotify. And uh, if you want to listen to me talk about television romance and TV shipping, uh, that would be The Shipping Room. And that you can find anywhere that you get your podcasts. uh, And you can follow that handle at Shipping Room Pod. And the other one is at Heart of Dixie Pod. Awesome. Uh, So, Christine, this is not going to be your last time on the show. Far from it. Uh, we've got some plans coming up for you. Just qu- uh, quickly want to shout out a uh, friend of the show. Uh, her name is Ageline, and she is half of the duo behind the Feminist Frequency podcast. I was recently a guest on there, and uh, we talked about the movie Happy Gilmore, one of my favorite comedies. So go and check that out. We d- recorded that recently. I had a blast uh, with them, and I'm going to be back on the show soon. So make sure they've got a ton of content. They've been recording for almost as long as we have, and I think their episode count actually beats ours. So they've got a lot to check out and i would and i believe they also started a disney podcast recently so uh please that's a feminist frequency podcast uh also want to give a shout out to a former uh guest on the show more who was recently featured in the coast lucas did you see that no it was more was it oh was it for frail hands the frail hands it was i I was at that show oh nice how was it that was it was it was a great time yeah no uh, um another one of my friend's bands labise was playing in it and they're really good as well you can check them out on Bandcamp as well as frail hands um and and yeah no oh i'm so happy war was at the coast that's dope yeah and congratulations to them and uh and to frail hands all right so here's uh here's what we got in the schedule coming up next week you may have noticed that we didn't do any emails on this show and that's because i am saving them we've actually got quite a few emails that i'm saving for another email mailbag episode so if you want to send us a couple of emails i'm going to be probably recording that on monday so if you want to send us some over the weekend to add to the show please do that's elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com also on that email show i'm going to be making an announcement about the Patreon. Our patrons, our lovely patrons, have been helping to decide a new piece of content that is going to be uh, coming forth very soon. So I'm going to explain to you what that is and why that's happening. 
and uh, yeah, and why you should uh, join the Patreon. And Christine is not going far because I decide I'm going to include a little extra special something in the next episode. We're going to be taking a look at a video visit from Mark Brown. Christine, I'm really excited to check this out. I just found this completely randomly on YouTube, and I was like, okay, we got to do something. And I this. have actually seen this before. So when you sent it to me, I was like, oh my goodness, I know this video. <laughs> so. <laughs> so yeah. So, yes, you can check that out on YouTube, a video visit from Mark Brown. I'm going to include that as the second half of next week's episode. And then in two weeks, we'll be back with another episode of Elwood City Limits. Lucas, you and I are going to be talking about Arthur Ways In and the Law of the Jungle Gym. Ooh, those are really good ones, guys. Okay. Like, I, all I have to do is, like, all I have is the is the titles here. So I'm just like, something about... Arthur gaining weight, and uh, I, I don't even want to guess what the second one. I, it could be anything, as far as I know. Well, Chris, Chris, Christine, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here, and it won't be long till we hear from you again. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, I mean, we we generally try to keep it clean. So maybe your uh, maybe your five year old can uh, can listen along. I I appreciate. I was actually I was so nervous that I was going to slip and cuss, and that you were going to have to bleep me. <laughs> Well, we actually we're I think we're starting to get a little comfortable with the like the soft cusses. So like the uh you know, we're we're, we're teetering closer to PG-13, but I'd like to think that, you know, we, our 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 listeners have grown up with us. So, you know, I've never gotten any we haven't gotten any emails from like concerned parents or anything. Um so, I mean, and hopefully that that won't happen, but you know, we 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 generally try to keep it clean. Sorry if we're you know, we are, of course, know. the number one family friendly podcast in Alpha. Well, I mean, it's also, true. I mean, it's an, it's Arthur. You, you know, you got to keep it clean for Arthur. Absolutely. It was it was weird. Like the first episode that we did, like we like we actively like if you go back and listen, to that, like I swear a couple of times in it. And then after we were done, I was just like, OK, do you want to just like not do swearing? It felt really weird <laughs> no I, I actually it's one of the things i enjoy about listening to your show <laughs> there we go that's all the reason in the world to do it all right so that's been elwood city limits my name is will young we'll catch up with you real soon and for lucas mancini everything hurts but that's normal <laughs> and christine lescody <laughs> oh thank you guys so much <laughs> we'll see you next time r.i.p mr peanut though Oh, pour one out for my boy. It's just like he he's a drawing. Like you can just draw him alive. <laughs> you have the power to do this. Well, I thought to myself like what is this marketing technique that they're doing? I don't understand. And then I was like, well, I mean, I'm tweeting about it with like 50,000 other people, yeah. so there it is. <laughs> it's it's it, it just as planned. It's perfect. <laughs>